what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, talk for about an hour about sex addiction, what it is, really the 101 of it. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about technology and how it's affecting sexual disorders. I'm writing a Jennifer Schneider and I, and Jennifer, you will love this, is probably 72 or something like that. She's written, like, I think, 18 books. She's a really good friend of mine. And she and I are writing a book on sex, uh, how, how technology is affecting sex, intimacy, and relationships. Because I don't think there's anybody in this room who hasn't seen technology to the good or the bad, whether it's dating online or chat rooms or you know some of the stuff that I deal with. Uh, technology is affecting people's intimacy, their relationships, and their sexuality. And I don't hear much conversation about that in the culture, so I'm very interested in that. In fact, I would say the juxtaposition of technology and sex more or less is really where my main interest lies these days. But why don't we get started? Hmm. What can we say? I used to roll this list out and talk over it. But the longer the list got, the harder it was to make a joke out of it for me. Because what I see is a bunch of men here who have tremendous gifts in various areas of their professions and a lot to give, but they're, they were all brought down in one way or another by their sexual behavior. And one of the things that I do um, talk to the press about when they call me is they usually say about people like this, well, why would such a smart, attractive, interesting, well, except maybe for Larry Craig, but why would such a smart, well, attractive, interesting person do such a stupid thing? You know, they've got a spouse, they've got lots of money, you know, they have success. Like, why would someone like this do that? And the answer is that uh, intellectual intelligence has nothing to do with your emotions very often. And uh, our intellect is probably one of our greatest gifts. But let me tell you this. If you starve your emotions, they will win every time. You know, and I use that word starve uh, both to bring up Carolyn, who's going to be on later, a good friend of mine. But also, um, you know, just think about it. If you didn't eat this morning and you didn't eat last night and you didn't eat breakfast, uh, lunch yesterday and you were sitting here trying to listen to me, it would be very hard to focus. Your intellectual capacity would be impaired by your need, your physical need to eat. And if you empty yourself out emotionally, as I believe many of the careers that these men have had uh, does, but you don't you know, replenish yourself with, with emotional nurturing and connection, you're going to act out. Your emotions are going to win every time. So you know, I know that you know, when, the president, when a president of the United States who is an Oxford scholar is having sex with an intern in his office after being investigated and in the process of an investigation for sexual harassment, that that's not an intellectual decision. That's an emotionally based decision. When a congressman from New York with an eight month pregnant wife goes online on Twitter, tells me he doesn't know a lot about tech. When he goes on Twitter, younger people get that. Um, sorry, I, I, I have moved into the younger generation with tech, but, um, of which I'm gonna shame you about later. But, um, but uh, you know, I don't think that Anthony Weiner was thinking very clearly when he went in the congressional gym and started texting his penis to people around the country. And I don't think that was really, in fact, if I'd gone in his office a few weeks earlier and said, you know, uh, Congressman, how would you feel if we just took a few pictures of your penis and put them up online? <laughs> you know, I think he would have thrown me out with security guards and yet he managed to do that all by himself, you know. Um, let me say something about him. Uh, uh, you know, that was last summer's scandal, by the way. That was, you know, the, the media loves a scandal. And I'm, I'm horror stricken and and very pained by what happened in Aurora last week. But on the other hand, I felt raped by the media at the same time because I felt like I couldn't turn on the TV without hearing every detail over and over and over and over and over and over and over again because there was a, finally a story that the media had to tell this summer. Well, last summer it was Anthony Weiner. And um, I jumped in there with the rest of you. I was like, what a sleazy so-and-so. Do you believe it? He had a wife. And he was a congressman, you know. And, and I started, and then I remembered, oh, yeah, I'm a clinician. A clinician. <laughs> and I work in sexual disorders. You know, I kind of woke up in the middle of that week, somewhere after the president asked him to resign. And I thought, here's a man who's uh, about to lose his marriage, his career. He's been publicly humiliated about as much as any man can be humiliated. And everyone in the world has seen his penis, which wasn't particularly impressive. So. <laughs> I meant the fact that it was on. I don't know what you people are thinking. But anyway, um, I would have killed myself. I would have killed myself. I mean, with that, I don't think my ego could have tolerated that. And um, I know that that man stood in front of the mirror at some point during that two-week period and said to himself, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? How could I have done that? What was, what's wrong with me? 
You know, and the thing is, I know why he did that. I know why all of these men, although I can't say that they're all sex addicts, because I haven't interviewed them, I haven't assessed them, I haven't met them, but I understand why it is that people make really poor decisions around sex um, or other addictive behaviors, uh, potentially addictive behaviors, when they are not nourishing and replenishing their soul, if you will. Um, so I wanted to put that out there to you. But what I also want to say about these men is that all of them are men who mortally wounded their careers in one way or another because of their sexual behavior. But my question to you is, what if their problem had been drugs and alcohol? Because uh, if you listen to Patrick Kennedy, he's Ted Kennedy's son. He was congressman from New Hampshire for uh, seven years, I believe. And he was arrested during that seven year period twice for DUI. Uh, he went to Promises or Betty Ford or the ran you know, wherever he went. And, um, you know, and he talks about this. So I feel, you know, he talks about recovery. That's part of what he does now. So I feel good about talking about it. But the thing is, is that he got to serve out his term in Congress twi after two DUI arrests. Had he had a prostitute in the car or a transgendered person or there'd been some kind of sexual act going, I doubt that he wouldn't have been able to keep his congressional seat. And that my point about it is that it is our stigma against the problems of, uh, the, the sexual problems that many people have, that we judge them very differently than we might with other emotional or mental disorders. We uh, label them, we, uh, uh, we have bad names for them, we uh, project our own shame onto them, all of that kind of stuff. So one of the things, my goals today is to try to help destigmatize sexuality a little bit. Um, and I'll tell you what my big, one of my, and I'll, I'll go on to the next slide in a second, one of my biggest pet peeves is there's almost not a treatment center in America. Tr addiction treatment center, mental health center, psychiatric facility, where you will go in and they will talk to you about sex. I mean, they will ask you about your diet, your exercise, your social activities, and your assessment, right? Your work habits, your family relationships, your, you know, your family of origin. You know, they're gonna ask, you know, you're gonna get a physical, but nobody's gonna ask if you masturbate. Nobody's going to ask you, uh, how have your sexual relationships been going? How often are you sexual? And to me, it's like, you know, I eat, I breathe, I'm sexual. It's part of my being. It's part of myself, you know? It's not something I want you to all see necessarily, but when I'm talking to a clinician about the problems that I have in life as an entire unit, I want them to hear all about me. And one of my missions in life also and, uh, is to get that word out. And we're beginning to see change in that area. These questions are beginning to be asked because people relapse over their sexual behavior. And all of a sudden treatment centers are waking up and saying, oh my goodness, we're working really hard with some of these people and they're not staying sober. And why is that? Well, because they're going back to where they got the drugs for their sexual behavior and that's where they end up returning the drug use or a whole bunch of different reasons. But if you don't deal with a whole person, I believe, you're gonna have a much uh, greater likelihood for relapse. Um, so we, we, I believe we need to talk about sex. So I'm very glad to be here. Um, now this is a mythological being, this sex addiction thing. You know, it doesn't have a diagnosis, and we're gonna talk about that. But I think um, it's really useful to talk about the myths. You know, what is, what is actual fact, and what do people think sex addiction is? So I'm gonna go over a couple of things. First of all, we don't, we have to do differential diagnosis. You know, those of you who are clinicians know that if somebody's manic during a, uh, a, a manic phase of a bipolar disorder, that they will, may be hypersexual. So I don't want to call somebody a sex addict because they're being hypersexual as a part of a manic phase. There are some people who might be doing crystal meth or cocaine and they will be hypersexual during their stimulant, stimulant use. I don't want to call somebody a sex addict because they are only acting out sexually when they are using stimulants. So, um, I have to assess and rule out things like ADD, OCD, bipolar disorder, and active drug abuse uh, before I rule in sex addiction. Now, let me just say I am not saying, just like you can be an alcoholic and be, have OCD, or you can be an alcoholic and you can have, be bipolar, you can also be a sex addict and have these issues, but I need to make sure that they are stable on these emotional and mental disorders and not using before I can say, okay, they're still acting out consistently in their sexual behavior, there must be something else going on. Um, sex addiction is not poorly researched. We have a tremendous amount of research on sexual addiction. There are areas of the diagnosis of where we are lacking research and that is yet to come. In fact, I can tell you in a second what that is. Um, but there is enough, there's more peer reviewed research on this topic than there is for any of the fetishes, any of the paraphilias, almost any other sexual disorder that's in the current DSM. Um, However, to have a diagnosis of sexual addiction in the DSM has much broader political and legal implications than simply like 
somebody's into leather or they're into shoes or they're into panties or you know they have a fetish because um, to say someone's a sex addict if they're an offender for example that's a problem and we're going to talk about that because you know there are lots of offenders who would love to say oh I'm just an addict just you know get me out of prison and the problem the thing is that they may or may not be an addict but they're also an offender and it's a different issue so they have to have we have to meet a higher standard in order to actually have a diagnosis and by the way the areas of research that we're missing just in case anyone wants to dive into a research project um, we're missing research on tolerance you know does the behavior escalate if somebody uh, does it for a while, whatever it is, and I'll talk about that, and then they do more. Uh, is there withdrawal? If someone stops the behavior, do they have neurobiological symptoms of withdrawal? And we don't have enough research on women. Um, uh, and boy, isn't that always the case? Like every drug, every medical procedure, you know, all the men get tested, and then they say, oh, we haven't looked at women. Um, I'm really proud to say that um, I'm, I was uh, able to open the first treatment center in the country that has gender separate sex and relationship disorder treatment for women. And uh, we're a mile away from the men's house. <laughs> um, so that's a good thing, because you don't want men and women with sexual disorders to be anywhere near each other. <laughs> in fact, I don't think you want people in CD treatment who are male and female to be anywhere near each other, but that's a whole different story. So in any case, we are not poorly researched. Sex addiction is not fun. And here's a kind of confusing thing. Sex is fun, I mean, I hope for you. Um, recreational sex is fun, intimate sexuality is fun, you know, those are fun things. But sex addiction is not fun. And I'll tell you, um, it's kind of like this, you know, drinking can be fun, having a couple of cocktails for some people if they're not alcohol, you know, even getting drunk on New Year's or your, you know, your sister's wedding, great. You know, alcohol is a great social lubricant and they even say that a little bit of alcohol at the end of the day might be good for us. But not if you're an alcoholic. Because if you're an alcoholic, you don't, you drink and then you don't stop drinking, and you drink in ways that destroy your life. So, you know, most of the population, what, like 88% or something, or 90% has no problem, or, as far as we know, with alcohol, and then they can enjoy it, and it's fun. But that other 8 to 10%, or 12%, or wherever that number is on alcoholics, um, which changes with every study, um, those people can't drink like other people. And if you're a sex addict, you can't have sex like everybody else does. You know, it's, and, uh, you know, if you know anybody who's been to meetings or is in 12-step recovery in AA, I love, like, the newcomer who comes in in the first 90 days, you know, they're just, oh, my God, this is so wonderful. I love being in, and I have hope, and there are people around me. And then somewhere around the 92nd day, they go, but I can't drink, you know? <laughs> like, but, but I can't have a beer? You know, somewhere they kind of wake up, like, and then they get angry. Like, well, but everybody else gets to have a beer, and you mean I can't have a glass of champagne at New Year's? Of course, it's, like, August, but they're already thinking ahead to New Year's because they're alcoholic, right? And that's where sex addicts come from. You know, you mean I can't look at porn? You mean I can't see strippers? You mean I can't call that ex-girlfriend? You mean I can't just, and the answer is no, you can't. Other people may be able to, but you can't. And that's not coming from a place of being what they call sex negative. I'm not saying sex isn't a wonderful thing or a gift of God or a, you know, a lot of fun. Or, um, and I don't really have any particular prejudices about the kind of sex you have or who you have sex with or as long as they are consensual. But, um, the people that I work with end up destroying their lives because of their sexual behavior, much like some of the men you saw listed there. And so they don't, they, th for them, sexual behavior is not recreational, recreational sexual behavior is not fun because where they start out and where they end up are very different places. They often end up in places with sticky floors that smell bad, uh, with people that they don't really like. Uh, they end up getting arrested, they end up losing their careers, they end up losing their marriages, their children, um, men and women and they end up uh, you know, returning to drug and alcohol use. These are not fun things. So sex fun, sex addiction, not so fun. It's not my, I am not the morality police. You know, it's not, and I'm not, uh, I'm a secular counselor, so I don't come from any particular place uh, in terms of a religious background when I speak to my clients. Um, unless something is particularly important to them, and then I will be where they are. So as sex addiction therapists, we don't impose our moral views or our religious views on our clients. That's not our job. I don't call someone a sex addict because what they do sexually doesn't agree with my moral beliefs. And that's really important to say because you may not like the fact that somebody likes to engage in a particular kind of sexual behavior and it might make you very uncomfortable. That doesn't make them a sex addict. You know, um, that may actually mean there's nothing wrong with them at all. Um, so part of our work is to not uh, is to be cautious about our own feelings when people are telling us stories about their sexual behavior and not jumping to conclusions because we're uncomfortable with what they might have to say. Um, in, and I, uh, in order to follow that, I want to add these two things. Um, I don't diagnose someone as a sex addict because they like women's shoes or because they like to put on their wife's panties. You know, 
I, I don't necessarily want to watch them do that. But, um, you know, and I will have someone come in and, and say, you know, well, I, I can't stand the fact that I'm attracted to women's clothes. I like to wear women's clothes. I like to have sex with women, but I wear women's clothes. It rigs you crazy, and, you know, and I just hate myself for it. And, you know, that's a fetish. That's a paraphilia. There are ways of treating that. There are ways of looking at it. It doesn't necessarily mean they're a sex addict. And it's the same with sexual orientation. I work with men who are married, who have sex on the down low once a year, twice a year with a guy. And then they say, oh my God, I hate myself for being interested in guys when I'm with my wife and I love my family. And you know, so I, maybe I'm a sex addict because I, well, no, you have an orientation issue. Maybe you have a trauma issue. You know, I don't know what that issue is that is leading you to act in that way. But I'm not going to call you a sex addict because you don't like a behavior and you wish you weren't doing it. And it's a secret. So that's not how we identify sex addiction. So what I'm basically saying to you is that we don't identify it by what turns you on. And we don't identify it by who turns you on? Those are neither one of those things are how we say that sex addiction. I will go on to tell you how we do identify it, but we don't identify it in that way. Um, any of you cre treat crystal meth addicts? A couple of you? Okay. Uh, this is a message from the crystal meth community through me to you. Um, because I've done some education, some work with those people. I've dealt with some uh, very savvy crystal, uh, crystal meth therapists and professionals. And what I can say to you is this, that it's really, really important to talk to those people about, uh, if someone is a crystal meth addict or a cocaine addict who's, who's acted out with stimulants and sex, it's really important to talk to those people about what kind of sex are they going to have sober? That's a really important question for them. Because if you don't, what happens is they long for that sexual intensity where they could be up on drugs for three days and up with Cialis or Viagra for three days, if you get my meaning. And uh, you know they want to go back to that. And they want to go back to that sexual intensity they had when they were getting high. And the reality is, is that you can't have that without drugs. So if they're going to be sober on drugs, they have to get used to a sexual arousal pattern that doesn't involve the intensity they were experiencing when they were using. And that's very disappointing to a crystal meth or cocaine addict who fused sex. So you have to talk to them about the grief that they're going to have about the loss of that sexual intensity that they love. And what are they going to do sexually sober? Because a lot of times, what they'll do is they'll go back to the places or the people where they were being sexual, because that was where it was really hot and exciting, and guess where the drugs are? You know? And I'm not just talking about gay guys, by the way. I mean, gay men and uh, crystal meth is a big issue. But let me tell you, I have a lot of heterosexual men in my practice or in our work who will go to uh, motels and hotels with a bag of cocaine or a bag of crystal and they lock themselves up in the hotel room and look at porn for three days or they hire a bunch of prostitutes to hang out with them for a few days. It's really the same behavior. It's uh, not exclusive to orientation. But the, if you treat crystal meth addicts, please talk to them about sex and in particular, what kind of sex are they going to have when they're sober? Finally, I just want to say that um, and this is the biggest piece I'm going to say, and some of you are not going to get this as many times as I say it. You will leave here and say, well, that was a very interesting talk about sexual offending. Or some will raise your hand and you'll say, what about those people who touch children? And I could give you a whole day on that material, and I would love to talk about sexual offenders. I think they're a very misunderstood population um, in terms just because we see them all the same, that we paint them with the same brush, and they're all very different. But nevertheless, um, that's not what we're talking about today. So what I do want to do is define sexual offending for you. And the reason I'm defining it is because it's a legal term. You know, if you are in Arkansas and you have sex with someone at a certain age, that may be acceptable. But if I have sex with someone at that, who's that same age in California, I'm going to go to jail. So what is offending in one state is not considered offending in another state. And if I went to Thailand, it would be a very different story about what was acceptable in that culture in terms of legality. So I prefer to look at... Uh, I think it's more useful to look at what sexual offending is in terms of uh, what is consensual. We define sexual offending as uh, non-consensual sexual behavior. If I am um, on a crowded bus or subway and I rub my hand past Kathy's butt or her breasts and she didn't ask my permission, I've offended her because I don't have her consent. If Carol is in the shower this morning. What time did you shower? Did you shower this morning? Well, never mind. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so if I walk by Carol's house at 7.30 when she's in the shower and she didn't say, hey, Rob, come on over and look at me. I'm going to be in the shower. I've offended her because I haven't. Con she hasn't given me her consent. That's the simplest way to define offending. Rape, violent forms of sexual behavior, sexual behavior with people who are not old enough to consent or people who are not conscious enough to consent or people who are not mentally healthy enough to consent. Offending is about consent. 
So what I'm talking about when I talk about sexual addiction and when I use that term, I'm talking about people who engage in consensual sexual behavior. And by the way, that's why we don't have a lot of research on it. That's why we don't have the research dollars flowing from the NIH, because there's never been any great interest in studying problematic consensual sexual behavior. The idea is if you're an adult, you're doing what you want to do and you're having a good time and you know that's your choice and you can do whatever you want to do so and and everybody gets to do what they want to do sexually as long as they're not hurting someone as long as it's consensual and that's fine unless it's destroying your life but the percentage of people whose life it's is being destroyed don't necessarily go out there and tell their stories very often you know we don't have a Betty Ford you know in my field there isn't someone to say you know anybody could have this problem so um, we don't have research dollars. We don't, you know, any research that's done has come from the private sector. It's not an area, and by the way, you know those people who come out of addiction treatment and they're like, oh my God, my life has been saved. I got my husband back. I got my wife back. Our family's restored. We want to start a foundation for our recovery. That doesn't happen in my area of work. You know, I don't have many women who say, thank God my husband's not seeing three prostitutes a week and looking at three hours of porn a night and, you know, and I want to, you know, with the area in the area that I work with, people want to deal with the problem and have it go away as quickly as possible and never talk about it again. So that's hard to get cultural momentum around. It's interesting, and, and by the way, it's interesting to me that we don't have a diagnosis. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, what's happened, I work in one of the few areas of mental health where people are coming to us and saying, I think I have this problem, um, or we're hearing what they're saying and we're saying, hmm, it sounds like this, but there's no diagnosis for it. You know, it doesn't really, in other words, uh, most diagnoses, what happens is um, the mental health community create, looks at a bunch of people, says, oh, look, they're all doing this and let's call it that. And then when people come in, we say, oh, you must have that. But I, we actually have people coming to us saying, I think I have this problem with sex, and there is no diagnosis. It's a very different thing. So let's talk about the diagnosis. I think that's coming. First of all, I want to give you a definition for addiction. This is from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, 2011. It says, addiction, and you can find this online if you go to the ASAM website. Addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, memory, and related circuitry. Dysfunction in these circuits lead to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in an individual patho pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. Those three words are a game changer. Because really what we're saying, what they are saying, what the American Society of Addiction Medicine is saying is that addiction is not just about substances. It's also about behavior. So now we look at gambling and sexual behavior and eating disorders and we see that they have qu the qualities of addiction that we also see in people who have problems with substances. And guess what? Very similar forms of treatment that we use with people who have problems with drug and alcohol are very effective or moderately effective, as effective as you can be in addiction, with people who have eating problems and sexual problems and gambling problems. So this was a game changer for us and very important to point out because it really says, and, and by the way, I'm incredibly grateful to be living in this time. Because 25 years ago, well, Pat Carnes really, one thing Pat did, and I have to honor him, he beat the bushes. Do you know that expression? You know, I get to walk in the media, and people don't say to me, believe me, this is true. You know, people don't say to me, oh, yeah, so that sex addiction thing, I mean, really, it's just a bunch of hooey. They don't say that anymore. They say, wow, this person is a sex addict. What does that mean? Or tell me more about sex addiction. I want, you know, Pat, that's what Pat did. He beat the bushes to the point where people could say, wow, maybe this is a possibility. And that left room for the rest of us to rush in behind him and say, here's the literature, here's the education, here, you know, all of the things that have come since and that still go on. Now, um, is sex addiction in the DSM? Is it a mental health diagnosis? Well, the answer is it was. Um, in uh, the DSM 3, there was a descriptor meaning it wasn't an actual diagnosis, but it was something that could be described under sexual disorders NOS, not otherwise specified, in the DSM-3. There was a descriptor that said sexual addiction. That word was actually in the DSM-3. And then in the four, it was taken out completely. And I, I've been writing about this. It's really interesting to me. At the very same time, we had this internet-fueled explosion in problem sexual behavior. What, that's a, almost the exact same moment that the DSM took the words out of the, out of the book. And it's not in the 4, it's not in the 4TR at all. There's no language for it. You can say sexual disorder NOS, but there's no longer a descriptor of sexual addiction. It doesn't exist. So now, in the 5, which will be out next year, there is a consideration for um, hypersexual disorder. And I'm really proud to say that my, our agency in California, the Sexual Recovery Institute, was the, the, 
had the most research subjects for the most recent surveys for the DSM committee. So I'm really proud of that. We offered a lot of people that were willing to tell their stories to try to see if this could become a diagnosis. Now, I think it's useful to talk about what it means to not have a diagnosis. When you don't have a diagnosis, but you see problem behavior, this is what happens. You have moral judgment. You have people say, well, those are bad people. Those are perverts. Those people are sleazy. You have religious abuse where someone says, you know, you're not godly or you're not spiritual. Um, you have misdiagnosis, you know, where people get, and I used to have this a lot in the 90s, where pe people would come in on lithium, you know, or Depakote because they were diagnosed with bipolar and they weren't bipolar. They were just up all night looking at porn, you know, or they were, they were manically searching for a sexual partner, but that was the only area in which they demonstrated any hyper anything behavior. They weren't manic, so there's misdiagnosis. And, I want, and often we have misdirected treatment with medication. Now, I want to recall to you what alcoholism looked like before 1970. Because I grew up, that's when I grew up, and I remember very clearly how the culture looked at alcoholism. You know, when Mannix and Hawaii Five-O, the first one, were on TV. And I remember sitting at home with my parents and we'd be watching TV, and inevitably when an, uh, someone who had an alcohol problem was on the television set, it was someone who was, it was a man, he was lying in the gutter with a raincoat. He was clutching a bottle. He had no job and no family. That's what an alcoholic was prior to the 1970s. And my dad, who was you know, World War II generation, uh, greatest generation kind of guy, would look up at the TV at that guy lying on the ground and say, oh, well, that's a bum. And that's how alcoholics were looked at until the 1970s, is they were bums. And so now we don't look at alcoholism that way anymore, and we don't portray it that way anymore, thanks to, really, in great part, who? Gotta, gotta give, the, give the dibs at Betty Ford, you know, all of a sudden when she came out and said, I'm an alcoholic and I have a drug problem, then it could be your grandmother. Then there was an identif- and it was a wife of a president. I mean, it became an identifiable issue for people to be, an acceptable issue for people to be able to say, wow, I might have this problem. So the problem that we have is without a diagnosis, we are really, for the kind of sexual disorders we treat, we're very open to people being bad people. And I, you know, I've seen a few bad people. I've seen a few sociopaths and psychopaths. And really, there are prisons for those folks, and that's where they belong. But um, they're not that big a percentage of the population. There are people who have other kinds of problems that can be easily judged and labeled because we don't have a diagnosis for them, and this is one of them. Um, now, I want to give you a diagnosis update. There's a gentleman I, I have, I'm so honored to have become a friend of. His name is Marty Kafka. And Marty is... Um, a, uh, an MD uh, psychiatrist at Harvard who's on the APA, the American Psychiatric Association Committee for Sexual Disorders, and um, he wrote the diagnosis that's proposed for the DSM. And this is what he did. He did, this is really, I heard him speak, and as I said, we've become friends, and this is what he did, because I, I heard him say it. First, he did a historical review of problem sexual behavior, and he said, has this problem ever existed in history? You know, have we had people who were described in literature or history as having problem out of control sexual behavior? And indeed, he found that there was a history going back to like the 13th century of people writing about people who had what they called nymphomania, Don Juanism, they had all kinds of names for this, but it was people whose sexual behavior seemed, uh, you know, unquenchable, if you will. And then he looked at the more recent models that have been created. Um, for this idea of sexual addiction. So you have Carnes and pa Pat Carnes, who is you know, my mentor and where I uh, trained and was educated. And he came up with this model called sex addiction. And he looked at it as an addictive disorder. He is one of four models, the most known of the four. Eli Coleman, who's at the University of uh, Minnesota and has an amazing human sexuality program, calls it sexual compulsivity. Um, Kinsey, not to be left out of the picture, the Kinsey Institute, uh, but they're not very good with words, they called it out of control sexual behavior disorder. Okay, um, and then the APA came in with their sexual disorder, NOS, you know, with this little title called sex addiction. So each of these organizations, each of these groups, each of these people did research, created models, all that stuff, and he looked at all of that and all the research, and then he created a diagnosis, which I'm gonna share with you, and this is as dry as it's gonna get today. Here's the proposed diagnosis, and by the way, um, I wanna say to my f fellow clinicians, all of us are gonna bitch, pardon my language, about the DSM. We're all gonna have something to say about it. You know, it'll be out next year and all of us are gonna say, I can't believe they did that, or how could they have said that, or what were they thinking? But I, I also wanna say to you, my peers and colleagues, that we all had an opportunity to give input to the DSM. That there were two or three opportunities to go online, read the diagnosis, and make comments. And many thousands of people did, but the comments they really wanted were from us.
because they wanted to hear the mental health community that was not the psychiatric community uh, have a say. So you, it, when you go to say, and I'm not a huge fan of how the DSM is created because it's created all by MDs, and I'm not sure that's the best method, but nevertheless, um, when you go to complain about the DSM next year, think about whether you went to the site and said something about the diagnosis or you didn't. Because if you didn't, it makes it a little harder to justify complaining because you know, we have an opportunity to contribute, which I believe ended at the end of June. Here is the proposed diagnosis, which you can find online on the APA. All the proposed diagnoses are online. And if you're in a particular area of treatment, like eating disorders or chemical dependency or depression or, you know, or child, child, go look and see what the diagnosis is going to look like. You can read the DSM now because it's not going to change much between now and next year. So this is what Dr. Kafka wrote. He said, over a period of at least six months, recurrent and intense sexual fantasies, sexual urges, and sexual behavior in association with four or more of the following criteria. And I want to point out two things before I start the criteria. Number one, four out of five is a very high, um, you have to, re what's the word for that? A very high, ratio. Ra it's not a ratio, threshold. threshold, I like that word. So it's a very high, most DSM diagnoses are three out of five, four out of seven. This is four out of five, so he's put a very high standard up for this to be the case for someone. The other point that I want to make is what Marty really got right, and I, he really got this right, is that sex addiction is m just as much about fantasy and urges as it is about behavior. In fact, my, I would suggest to you it's a lot more about fantasy and urges than it is about behavior. If you look at how my clients spend most of their time, it's in the pursuit of sex, the search for sex, the idea of sex, the excitement about sex, the, the planning for, you know, all that stuff. The sexual act usually doesn't take that long. So, he really got right the fact that this, is a, this disorder is a lot about its disordered thinking and, and obsession, if you will. Um, so the, here are your criteria. Excessive time is consumed by sexual fantasies and urges and planning, oh sorry, and planning for and engaging in sexual behavior, so time. Repeatedly engaging in sexual fantasies, urges, and behaviors in response to dysphoric mood states like anxiety, depression, boredom, or irritability. Repetitively engaging in sexual fantasies, urges, and behaviors in response to stressful life situations. Repetitive but unsuccessful efforts to control or significantly reduce these sexual fantasies, urges, and behavior. And repetitively engaging in sexual behavior while disregarding the risk for physical harm or emotional harm to self or others. Number five is many of the men I work with who all have sex with prostitutes and have sex with their spouse, and they're not having safe sex with the prostitutes, and they're not having sex with their spouses. So I see that all the time. Um, a lot of guys will say, oh, well, oral sex, you don't need the protection for oral sex. We can't get anything. I mean, it's really not, that's not a problem, right? Well, yes, you can. You can get a whole bunch of diseases from oral sex, and you can pass them all on to your spouse, male or female. Um, so this is what he said we need to have four out of five in order to have the disorder. And then he added the following. There's a, there has to be clinically significant personal distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of functioning associated or related with the frequency and intensity of these fantasies, urges, and behaviors. So it's getting in the way of your life. It's causing distress. And, um, and, and he said these sexual fantasies, urges, and behavior are not direct, are not due to direct physiological effects of exogenous substances like crystal meth or manic episodes. So he ruled that stuff out. So that's what the diagnosis looks like. Is it going to make the DSM? No. It will probably make the appendix if we're lucky. Um, it may make the appendix. And it's a good thing to make the appendix because then you get money for research. Then young people who are really fired up around wanting to get their PhD go and, you know, harass their committee to get, you know. So people who are excited about wanting to grow the field see something in the appendix and they say, wow, I want to prove whether that's true or not. So it's actually a good thing if we make the appendix. I doubt we'll make the, the um, main body of the book, which means, by the way, that at least another seven to eight years are going to go by with no disorder for sexual acting out disorders, except there's going to be a uh, diagnosis called behavioral addictions, NOS, which I guess, you know, like video gaming and stuff like that. So you're going to be able to fit this under that, but we still have no diagnosis. And you think we have a problem now with people that are sexual acting out? Well, with the new technologies that are evolving, you have no idea what's going to happen. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, oh, and the person has to be 18. And by the way, if you think that the committee doesn't read the things people type in online, the, that was added because so many people said the person had to be over 18. Per, uh, personally, I don't agree with it. Um, most people I know who have fetishes, paraphilias, offenders, sex addicts knew that they had sexual problems and demonstrated forms of that in adolescence and childhood. 
But um, nevertheless, none of the other sexual disorders, because you know, no one in our country actually has sex before 18, right? I mean, especially in Texas, Oklahoma, um, just, sorry. <laughs> 